We're going to be uh, studying the uh, prophets of the Old Testament who are these uh, odd, eruptive kind of figures. Uh, but in this first segment, what I want to uh, focus on uh, is that these uh, weird characters who appear in uh, the life of ancient Israel uh, were not in fact free-floating individuals, but they were people who were deeply rooted in uh, traditions that cluster around the, the memory of Moses in the Old Testament. And what I want to do in this first segment uh, is to talk about the mosaic memory uh, without which I think the prophets uh, probably cannot be understood. Uh, even though they uh, stand at a great chronological distance from the Moses memory, it is clear that the stuff that we find in the early part of the Old Testament was very much available to them uh, and they were much shaped and informed and energized by it. And when one wants to uh, discover the part of the Moses tradition that was most important, I believe that it is the Sinai tradition that is found in Exodus uh, 19 to 21 uh, that particular body of text shows Israel having come out of uh, slavery in Egypt and they meet God in this awesome confrontation uh, at Mount Sinai and uh, three things happen at Mount Sinai that I believe are important for the prophets. The first one is that God gives the Ten Commandments and uh, that stands at the tap root of the prophetic tradition. The second thing that happens is that Israel swears allegiance uh, to uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, and promises to be God's covenant partner in obedience to the Torah commandments. The third thing that happens is that in Exodus 19, the chapter before the Ten Commandments are given in chapter 20, uh, God has Moses say, if you will obey the commandments and if you will listen to my voice, then you will be my covenant partner and my holy people and the priestly kingdom and all of that good stuff. Now it seems to me that that if in Exodus 19 is really definitive for biblical faith because what it says is that this relationship to God that is the the gift of their life that this relationship depends upon uh, obedience and so there come with the with the covenant uh, what what interpreters call sanctions or blessings and curses so you get blessings if you keep the commandments and you get curses if you do not keep the commandments and that becomes enormously important uh, when the prophets begin to uh, unfold uh, their teaching many centuries later. What interests me about Exodus 19 is that when God says that through Moses, if you will obey, God does not say the negative, if you don't, you won't, but it's clearly implied. Immediately, uh, Israel swears allegiance to the commandments and they swear allegiance to the commandments before they know what the commandments are going to be. So I've been asking a long time why do they swear allegiance to the commandments and promise to obey them before they know what the commandments are? And I have come to the conclusion that the reason they do that is that they know that the commandments of the God of liberation will be better than the commandments of Pharaoh that they can still remember from their slavery in Egypt. So the Ten Commandments are to be understood as counter commandments, counter to the commandments of Pharaoh. And we know from the Exodus story in Exodus Five, that the commandments of Pharaoh were relentless and if you read down Exodus 5 what you get is Pharaoh saying make more bricks 
make more bricks. Don't be lazy, make more bricks. Make more bricks without straw. And the, and the, the brick making quotas of Pharaoh are uh, endlessly demanding and relentless. So it is living in a, in a production economy in which you ever can't ever satisfy Pharaoh's uh, quota of brick making that he has to have in order to build his granaries to, to store his immense wealth and surplus. So what the Israelites at Sinai figure is that the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments about how to organize their life differently, are easier commandments and so the the negotiation that happens at uh, Sinai that issues in a covenant is an alternative to life under Pharaoh. And from that moment on, Israel is sworn to covenantal allegiance and is aware that it is living in an alternative community with an alternative future uh, under alternative mandates with alternative possibilities and alternative promises. And it takes immense vigilance and intentionality to practice this alternative life in the world because the attractiveness of Pharaoh that has its hooks into the imagination of Israel always wants to draw Israel back into the production economy that is coercive and amounts to slavery. So they establish this covenantal relationship uh, that is summarized by saying, I will be your God and you shall be my people, and that is definitive. Now while they are still at Sinai, if you flip the Bible over a few chapters, from Exodus 24, you will come to Exodus 32, which is the story of the golden calf. And the golden calf is an attempt to make God out of a commodity. It's a nice, safe God because it doesn't ask anything, it doesn't give anything, it doesn't require anything. And when they make this golden idol, it just makes God madder than hell. And God wants to destroy God's covenant people. And Moses, who loves, it turns out Moses loves Israel more than God loves Israel. Moses intervenes with God and saying, you know, you ought not to destroy this people even though they've broken the covenant, why don't, you, why don't you see if you can remake the covenant? So in Exodus 32, 33, 34, Moses negotiates with God on behalf of Israel, and uh, Moses sort of intimidates God and says, if you, know, if you won't be their God, I'm not going to serve you anymore. And, and then Moses says, I would like to see your uh, face and God says you can't see my face but you can see my backside if you'd like to see that and then God announces that God is uh, steadfast and faithful and loyal and generous and kind and forgiving but has a kind of a serious side and you better pay attention so they negotiate all of this and then Moses, on behalf of Israel, uh, confesses their sin and begs for forgiveness and asks that the covenant should be restored. And the end of that conversation in Exodus 34 is that God says, all right, I will now renew the covenant. Now, the reason to talk about Pharaoh and Sinai and the golden calf, these three pieces of text in the book of Exodus, is that what they show is that 
Israel is bound in a dialogical relationship of give and take that is defined by fidelity, but the truth of the history of Israel is that it is an ongoing drama of covenant made and covenant broken and covenant remade and covenant broken and covenant remade. So that out of Mount Sinai comes this covenantal, liturgic, prophetic practice of trying to maintain a covenantal dialogical mode of existence in the world, except that the pressure of the golden calf, the pressure of the commodity, the pressure of Pharaoh's work quotas and production schedule, always talk Israel out of its dialogical existence into an existence of commodity and control and wealth and power. Now, if you take that as background, then what we're going to be studying in the segments of our study that follow this one is that five, six, seven hundred years after Sinai, the prophets are the strange voices that insist that the dialogical practices from Mount Sinai are still decisive and definitive for the life of Israel in the world. So the prophets are always again back at Sinai. The prophets are always back again thinking about Pharaoh's production schedules. The prophets are always again thinking about the seduction of the golden calf. And they insist in always new circumstance and new situation that the practice of covenantal existence is the true life of Israel. And our work in the life of the contemporary church is to continue to reflect on how we are called to live a life of dialogical covenant, which is an alternative existence, even though we, like ancient Israel, are always seduced out of it into other modes of existence. And so I believe that for the prophets, this great if of Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai, this great if hovers over our life to see whether we will be choosing a life of blessing or a life of curse. And that is our continuing work, I think.